Hey everybody, my name is Helen. In this video, we're gonna learn about ketoconazole. This is an ingredient in the famous Nizerol shampoo, and we're gonna learn about what its effect is on hair loss. Does it actually work? We're gonna look at some primary sources, meaning a study about this versus minoxidil. We're gonna hear what some doctors have to say, and we're just gonna basically get to the bottom of the truth behind ketoconazole and hair loss. I am not a doctor or a healthcare practitioner, but I have done a really good job, I think anyway, of sourcing primary sources and also just first-hand information from board-certified physicians that specialize in hair loss. And I'm gonna link everything down below in the description box just in case you wanna dig further into any of this stuff. What ketoconazole is, for the most part, is an antifungal ingredient and you will find it often in shampoo and that is often for the treatment of dandruff and other sort of scalp related type conditions. It also has anti-inflammatory properties and it also can function as an anti-androgen. What does that mean? There is something called dihydrotestosterone, which is also called DHT, which can build up on your scalp and some doctors and dermatologists ask for you to remove that using uh, Nizerol, which has a anti-androgen effect that I had mentioned. You can get uh, shampoo with ketoconazole in it prescribed by your doctor. Uh, another way that you can get it is just over the counter. Now in the US actually, the uh, prescription strength is 2% and the over the counter strength is 1% unless you live in Canada where we have actually, our over the counter stuff actually is 2%. I've got a little bottle here that I have tested out on this channel so I have given this shampoo quite a good go. You can see that older review. That's, I'll link that up. I know you're thinking, what, why do they get that in Canada? Look, just give us this. Okay. We don't, we don't get everything. We really don't get everything here. So <laughs> just let us have our 2%. You can get it very easily at the drugstore. You know, as I said, over the counter, you don't need a prescription. It will be stronger. Um, if you do get it obviously from your doctor, but this works as well. And I know that because I have tried it myself. Now using ketoconazole shampoo can enhance the effect of other hair loss treatments you might be using that are also topical, such as minoxidil. A great thing about this product is that it is quite safe. It's safe for use in kids. Uh, sometimes it is recommended for babies to use it for certain scalp conditions. It is considered safe during pregnancy. It's also considered safe if you're a nursing mom, so long as, you do, so long as the baby doesn't ingest it. Now, as for side effects, about 5% of the population are reported to have experienced burning, stinging, basically irritation, and that could also be due to an ingredient called PG, which is propylene glycol, and some people just have you know, a sensitivity or an allergy to this particular ingredient, causing them to have those side effects. The most common thing, the thing that I've sort of experienced and a lot of people really complain about, and I think maybe the reason this is not that popular among the hair loss and hair regrowth community is that it is very, it can be very drying to the scalp, to the hair, especially if you're only using this, and especially if I think you're using a lot of it. That was not my experience. I mean, you can watch the review that I did. I didn't actually find it as drying. I certainly didn't find it as drying, for instance, as mane and tail shampoo, which people rave about, but for me, it was just always too drying. But again, the thing that you're gonna find with shampoos and pretty much anything you're gonna put on your scalp, everyone's reaction is gonna be a little different. We all have different amounts of hair. We have different hair porosity. We have different scalp types. There's just so many different elements that go into scalp health, hair. It's almost even more to it than just on your skin because that in a way has less factors because you don't have like hair that you're trying to shampoo and style and have it manageable after, right? Or at least most of us don't anyway. So just to sum up my own experience with it, it, it was perfectly fine. It's not something that I particularly felt I needed to continue with for six months. I was getting pretty adequate response from just using Rogaine and I have shampoos that I love and all of that was working for me and continues to work for me, except for right now, my hair is very frizzy because I'm trying Virtue Flourishes, no, sorry, 100% drug-free for mild, moderate thinning set, the shampoo, the conditioner, and the scalp serum. So I'm using those and it's making my hair quite dry right now. Stay tuned for a full review. If you're watching this in the future, just navigate around. Maybe you can find the whole review. Uh, we'll see what ends up happening in terms of hair regrowth. I haven't seen anything yet, but it's only been a little while now, but I am trying this and my hair is kind of a hot mess, but in general, I like to use my Rogaine with my favorite shampoo. So um, for me, this was not a good long-term choice in terms of, I just didn't feel that I needed it. No slight against it. We're gonna look at a study though that tracked people that used it for six months. So we're gonna do that in a second, but first we're gonna talk some YouTube hair loss world gossip. So we have two really big YouTubers here, at least compared to me anyway, I'm a very small channel. We have the Hair Loss Show, which has got uh, hair transplant surgeons and the doctor you see most frequently here is Dr. Jaya Prakash. And that's one camp. And we've got this other camp of Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre is a very well-known dermatologist here. She has made an extensive 
series of videos all about hair loss. I'm sure you already know her if you found my channel. If you don't, I'm gonna link everything up, as I said, down below in the description box. Two board certified physicians. I do double check these things because, you know, I do trust them, but on the other hand, I feel like when you're a YouTuber repeating other people's information uh, and it's medical related stuff, you've got to do your due diligence. So I double checked. Now, Dr. Jaya Prakash is a board certified hair, tra hair transplant surgeon. So he's a surgeon and Dr. Dre is a dermatologist. So obviously those are slightly uh, different fields. Now, Dr. Jaya Prakash in a video about this, again, linked below, says that he just is not feeling like ketoconazole slash Nizerol is not something that he really prescribes to his patients. He feels like in terms of getting rid of the androgens, it's just not really that effective. I mean, you can watch the video for yourself, but I'm gonna give you the gist of it here. He kind of explains some of the stuff that I've already kind of gone over, including a study. He doesn't show you the details of the study, but I'm gonna show that to you in a second. Uh, he's just not really a fan. I can't really say he's advocating to use it. He's certainly not saying it's harmful and he's certainly sort of not trying to steer everybody against it per se in that video, but he's like, mm, kind of like very meh on it. So you've got that camp on one side. Then you've got Dr. Dre on the other, whose video very much sort of talks about all the different ways that ketoconazole Nizerol shampoo is used, all the different conditions that it can treat. And she was one of the main sources that I used to research this video. She's kind of pro uh, ketoconazole or Nizerol shampoo. She details how it can be helpful and sort of as an adjuvant treatment with other medications. And adjuvant means like an add-on treatment. It can help to make other things more effective, specifically in regards to hair loss. So she's kind of in the pro camp. She talks a bit about how much you can use it also saying like when it comes to like, if you're dealing with hair loss and you wanna use it, you don't have to use it every single time you shampoo. You don't have to use it that often. And I hear from a lot of women, they're recommended by their doctors to use it like two or three times a week max. Of course, it depends on how often you're washing your hair as well, um, but you don't have to use it every single shampoo because that can really contribute to very dry uh, straw-like hair, which you know most of us are trying to avoid in general. So why the difference in opinion? Well, I don't know for sure, but both doctors have given a slight indication as to why they maybe have a different view on this. Dr. Jaya Prakash in the aforementioned video straight up mentions that he's seeing people, he's a surgeon, right? So he's probably not the first line of defense. You know, he's not the family physician. He's not the dermatologist. My guess, and he kind of alludes to this, is like by the time people come to see him because he's a hair transplant surgeon, people have tried everything. They probably have seen the family doc. They've probably seen the dermatologist at that point. Perhaps they've gone down all the sort of over the counter and sort of topical type treatments you can do, which of course would include this shampoo, and they haven't been effective. So he's seeing them at a much, I think, later stage, I would imagine. Whereas you've got Dr. Dre, who's a dermatologist, and very often for us, for those of us suffering from hair loss, and you probably know yourself, you know, you either straight up go see your dermatologist if you already have one sort of among your healthcare practitioners, or you go to your family doctor and get a referral to a dermatologist. So that might be the first or the second physician that you see in regard to hair loss. And so in that case, they are gonna recommend it because there are studies that say it works. So I think that that's where Dr. Dre is coming from. And I think that's where Dr. Jaya Prakash are coming from. They just have different disciplines and they're seeing people at perhaps different stages of hair loss. So that's why one may be in favor. Hey, just give it a try. It has been shown to work, you know, over six months. And then you have your other Dr. Jaya Prakash, who's a surgeon, whose interventions are surgical. So at that point, you know, I think you're probably beyond topicals if you're going for surgery. Okay, so now let's have a look at the study together that Dr. Jaya Prakash had mentioned in his, and I believe Dr. Dre had alluded to as well. This study is called the Trichogenic Effect of Topical Ketoconazole versus Minoxidil 2% in Female Pattern Hair Loss, a Clinical and Trichoscopic Evaluation. This was published. December 5th, 2019, so relatively recent study. I'm gonna give you sort of the condensed version of this, of course, linked down below if you want to, if you're someone who loves to like look at studies, there are photographs, there are graphs, there are all kinds of cool stuff you can have a look at, but I'm gonna break it down for you so we can just see what this study says. There were 40 women in this study and the average age of them was 29 years of age. They took women from different, all kinds of different um, stages of hair loss, but all had androgenic alopecia AKA female pattern hair loss. They tested both, they tested a group with a ketoconazole formulation that they made themselves. It wasn't actually the over the counter, it wasn't this stuff, they made their own solution, but it was a 2% ketoconazole formula. 20 of them on that and 20 of them on minoxidil. So they divided it into 20 women were trying, uh, they were put in group A, 
trying the minoxidil and the other half of them, the 20 went into the ketoconazole group. And so they were testing them both for a period of six months. Something that really caught my attention in this study is that most of us don't use just 2% minoxidil one time a day. I'm guessing they were using the ketoconazole and the minoxidil the same amount or else it wouldn't make sense. You couldn't have people using minoxidil twice a day and have the ketoconazole users use it once a day. But anyhow, most of us don't use, I mean, some do, but most of us don't use just 2%. That uh, You do see that often. That formulation still definitely exists. But if you look at women's or men's Rogaine foam, and you guys know I use the men's Rogaine foam at 5% because it's cheaper and it's exactly the same inside the bottle. We use 5%, so I actually use a stronger concentration. So that's what made this study kind of strange to me. The amount is just so low of the minoxidil, but it is what it is. And so they compared these two for the peri a period of six months, checking in with them regularly. So this is what ended up happening. At the six month mark, both groups of women, so the uh, ketoconazole women and the minoxidil women, had the same amount of satisfaction with their hair growth progress at the same amount of time. It wasn't like the minoxidil ladies were like, oh my gosh, oh, you know, wow, fantastic, you know, this changed my life. And the women who just used the ketoconazole solution didn't feel that way. They had similar levels of satisfaction. And this is interesting because it plays into what I say here, which is that minoxidil can give you a boost, Rogan can give you a boost. It's not gonna give you like this usually, in my experience anyway, and definitely from the woman I hear from, doesn't give you this amazing, crazy response where you're like, oh, I can't, I can't believe this. My hair looks like when I was 18. Typically does not happen. It just gives you like a nice boost. And I suspect that the results of this study reflect that. The interesting thing though, is that you did see hair regrowth and improvement in both groups of women. Here's where it was different though. The minoxidil users saw quite a bit more improvement, I think at the four month mark, which if you think about it, what I say here often is that it takes sometimes four months for it to just kick in and start working. Whereas the ketoconazole women did not see really any sort of um, improvement until later on. So it took them, there was like a delayed response compared to the minoxidil. So that's interesting, right? So it was closer to the six month mark where the ketoconazole users were finally starting to see some difference. So, you know, that's great. Word salad, who cares? Let's look at some photos, right? Right. They actually have included some, some actual before and afters in this. I say, personally, I think 40 women is not that much. 20 in each group is just not a really big sample size. I would have liked to have seen thousands of women do this so that we can really get to the bottom of what's going on here. But there are just, there's photographic evidence. Let's have a look. Let's look at this together. Um, we've got here, this is a, a woman from the minoxidil group. So you can see her at her baseline, which is figure A here. And you can see, you know, just a, like a lot of diffuse hair loss. What I will say though, in this photo, and you'll see in the next one, her hair looks quite wet or almost gelled in this. And when you do this to your hair, it notoriously looks terribly thin, much thinner than it actually is. Because if you look at A and you look at D, D looks like a dry, brushed out hair, but A looks like sort of just showered hair. And maybe that's how they did it so that everybody could start with just like freshly showered hair. I really don't know how exactly they went about this, but to me, this hair looks wet. And when your hair is wet, it's gonna look so thin. Even my hair looks terribly like thin through here if I sort of just let it kind of air dry and it's kind of clumped together. So the clumped together hair, and it's not even parted the same as in D. So, you know, all I'm just saying is like, take these sort of photos slightly with a grain of salt. But they did actually count the hairs, right? So I'm, I am saying this because I'm just visually looking at this, but I mean, there were actual like clinicians who actually carefully counted the amount of hair. So you can see down below, this is like a close up small area where you can see it looks like the hair is maybe not more, but each hair looks thicker. Are you seeing that as well? Where the hair in E is much sort of finer, more brittle looking, and in H, it looks a lot more healthy, I suppose. The scalp looks pretty good to me in both of these, but I mean, what do I know? I'm not a clinician when it comes to these things. So yeah, so that was the monoxidil group. So I think uh, image C is the four month mark, so you can have a look there. So that looks, I guess, quite a bit filled in compared to A. So that was 2% of monoxidil. So now let's have a look at what the ketoconazole solution before and after, and this is just one person. I'm guessing that they use the most drastic or the best looking case, you know, to sort of make the study. That would be my guess. They probably had, you know, they probably took these pictures for every single woman. They just took the one that sort of showed off the results the best. So again, you've got figure A, like I mentioned, looks kind of wet, right? Or like maybe gelled on this woman. Whereas if you look at D, that looks like much drier hair that's been combed through and styled. Maybe even a hair dryer has gone through it. I really don't know. But there is a difference, but I think this difference is not as drastic personally. So that is the ketoconazole we're looking at here. 
Um, but we definitely are seeing some more filled in, especially toward the front. So, I mean, that's promising if you're someone who doesn't want to use minoxidil or can't use it for whatever reason and you just want to stick to ketoconazole, you know. But keeping in mind that if you look at four months, there wasn't really much a huge difference from the time before. But by D, I would say, by image D, she sort of caught up. I don't know. How do you, what are you thinking about this? It's really interesting, right? So again, if you want to see this with your own eyes, go ahead and check it out. And again, they do like a close up with a scalp count. The hair looks pretty similar, but I think that maybe I do see a bit more hair in H. It's really hard to visually compare these because, you know, we just see two cases here and uh, we're getting this sort of little slightly out of context sort of snapshot of the close up. So the takeaway from the study is that, like, basically it says here, it has a uh, ketoconazole has a high safety profile in contrast to traditional minoxidil, aka Rogaine therapy, um, but it is slower. That's, that's, that was the takeaway of this 40 person study published back in 2019. Super interesting, right? I really, my eyes were opened when I was sort of learning this and it sort of maybe reconsider, maybe I do need to start adding this back into my life. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. So there we are. That was the truth about ketoconazole and uh, all the information that you hear about, but just maybe gone into a slightly more detailed version. I hope that was interesting. Please remember to give this a like. Tell me your ketoconazole story down below. We can all help each other by sort of sharing what we've learned about using this on ourselves and the effect that we had. And uh, we'll see you in the next video. Thanks so much for watching.